We've all heard people say, she has baggage from her past, or watch out for her, baggage. But think about it, baggage. We get it from stuff that people say and do to us, and if we carry around those memories with us, essentially, we're just carrying baggage. Really, we begin collecting baggage when we're just little kids. Hey, there you are. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hey, I need to talk to you. Yeah? Well, we're talking about the princess tea party. We love princess tea parties. Yeah, see, that's the thing. You can't have a princess tea party with us. What? Why? Well, you really don't want me to tell you. Yeah, I do. Well, the girls, we were talking, yeah. and, well, you're too fat. What? You won't fit in our princess dress-up costumes. Uh, I'm not fat. Yes, yes. No, no, my mommy says I'm just big boned. Dinosaurs are big boned. You're fat. Well, well, mommy says I'm just a little chunky, that's all. Peanut butter chunky. You're fat. <laughs> but no, no, cause see, mommy says I've lost weight. I think you found it. Well, my mommy says I'm just a little different. That's Your mommy all. says you're different. Yeah, I'm just a little different. Go back to where you came from. Gotta go. Bye. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's the biggest lie we teach children. Words hurt. They cut deep. And if we carry around the words of others, well, we're just collecting baggage. See, we can't find our self-worth in things that people say and do to us. We have to find our self-worth in what Christ says about us in our relationship with Him. But it doesn't always seem to be that easy. Life goes on, we grow up, and we just tend to collect more baggage. And sometimes, we collect baggage from people who are very close to us, like a best friend. No, I know, Matt. It's like we have, we've talked for three hours and it's been five minutes. I know, I know, I know. Okay, Matt, I have to tell you something. I haven't said this to anyone in a really long time. Matt, I feel like you're my density. I really, really do. Mm, mm hmm You're right, you're right. I meant destiny. I feel like you're my destiny. Oh, hey, she's right here. I gotta go. Hey, what's up? Who are you talking um, to? My, my dad. Your dad is your destiny? Yeah, I mean, he raised me and everything. Kudos. That's really funny, because, you know, could have sworn I heard you say Matt. Yeah, I did. That's his name, Matt. Honey, your dad's name is Pat. That's his middle name. So you're telling me your dad's name is Matt Pat? Yeah, he was picked on a lot, so I tried to encourage him to tell him I love him. What's wrong with that? Okay, whatever. Anyway, so have you talked to my Matt? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, and? He's not... He's not going to be your Matt. Look, we just started talking. We kind of hit it off. We have this great connection. What? No. No, you're supposed to talk to him for me. I did. I started out doing that. You have to believe me. No. No, you're supposed to be my best friend, remember? I am your best friend. Don't let a guy come between us. No. Y you did this. You know that I've liked him since we were in kindergarten, and you were supposed to talk to him for me. But I've been your best friend since kindergarten. We always said growing up, best friends forever, right? Best friends forever? Best friends forever just got a whole lot shorter. Don't do this. No, Don't you, do this. you did this. Whatever. You're supposed to be my best friend. And see, our friends, well, they're just trying to get through life same as us. And sometimes they make poor choices and they mess up. We can either learn from that, forgive them and move on, or, well, we can pick up some more baggage. You know, the truth about baggage is that we really don't need other people to load it on us. See, we do a pretty good job of dumping baggage on ourselves. Like when we compare ourselves to others, when we say, if only I was just as popular as she is. If only, if only I was just as gifted and talented as they are, then maybe I would be okay. But I'm not. I'm a loser. 
I'm no good. And when we think that, more baggage. Or we find ourselves thinking, they have it made. And why is life so easy for them and so hard for me? I'm never going to make it. And when we buy into that lie, well, some more baggage. And sometimes, sometimes we get baggage from people who love us dearly. They just don't seem to realize that their words cut like knives. Hun? Hey, Mom. What happened out there? Well, well, the lights, the lights got in my eyes, and, and the ball slipped. The lights got in your eyes? Yeah. You know that's what cost us the game, right? Yeah. The ball slipped. How many times have I gotten up before work to work on you with this? There were scouts out there. I'm not, I know, I just... The ball slipped. Hey, coach. Butterfingers. I know. We'll work with her. Okay, <coughs> all right. See you later. Are you crying? How old are you? No. Well, don't. People are watching. Take your stuff and meet me in the car. Mom. I'm just disappointed. These were our dreams. Well, our parents, they don't mean, they don't mean to hurt us. They just have their baggage of their own. And, and if we don't deal with our baggage, we pass it on. For us, we need to find our self-worth in our relationship with Christ. And, and if we don't, we pick up some more baggage. It gets uncomfortable. It's tedious. And our natural tendency is to want to try to dump it on someone else. But always, always it backfires. Hey, sis, can I ask you a question? What are you doing in my room? Just want to ask you a question. What do you want? Is it okay if you take me and a couple of my friends to school? It's a little bit cold outside and I don't want to run back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, Whatever. That's so funny. Are you seriously asking me that? Yeah, I just want you to give me and a couple of my friends right to school. Okay, and, no. You know, so cold. No, that's not how it works. See, you need to understand something about us. Just because you and your loser friends are in high school now, doesn't mean I'm going to start driving you all over the place, okay? Because see, look at me. You need to understand that when people look at you, they see a freak. And if they know that we're related, if they know that you're my brother, of all things, then they're going to think that I'm a freak too. And I'm not okay with that, okay? So do whatever you got to do to get yourself to school. You can walk, crawl if you have to, I do not care. But I am not about to become a chauffeur for you and your idiot loser friends, okay? Okay. It's not my fault Dad left. Why do you keep on taking that on me? Whatever. No, you know I'm right. Okay, sorry. You're not sorry. You're only sorry when I call you out on whatever I ride my bike. I said I was sorry. I said I ride my bike. Come on. And in the process of trying to dump our baggage on other people, well, we pick up more baggage. And then there's that one. That's my sin. That's my secret sin. Okay. It's cool. I got this. It's under control. No big deal. Who am I kidding? Most days, it controls me. And this, well, this is the way I live. And yet, I hear the words of Christ who says, I have come that you may have life, and you may have it abundantly. Well, I don't know about you, but all this, this doesn't feel like abundant life. This feels like abundant suffering. I can't hardly walk. I can barely keep my balance. And... I hear the words of Christ again because he also said, Come to me, all you who are weary 
and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I want that. I want that, so I go to God and I say, Father God, please, if you are willing, just take all this baggage from me. I can't do this anymore. I'm miserable. I can't live this way. Please, just take it. And you know what? He takes it. involved in uh, stepping out of their comfort zones and standing up here on the stage, which isn't always easy, God. And I thank you for each and every person that's here today as we talk about baggage, Lord, that you would speak to their heart and that you would um, just be with us, Lord, as we are learning to give up our baggage to you and allow you to lead our lives and to control and to um, just learn to be happy within you. In your holy precious name, amen. Isn't that sad? That skit makes me period every time they do it. I don't know how you felt, but... Okay, sorry. Um, then we have friends in our lives, no matter what age we are, that we trust, that we share things with, that we ask to help us, that we ask to walk through things with us, who eventually let us down because they're just human. And then we go on and we have, we have family members. It could be our children that hurt us. It could be our siblings. It could be our parents. But because they love us and they push us and they want to help us, sometimes they end up hurting us through that. And then you have the times when we hurt other people. And because we're hurting, have you guys heard the saying, hurting people hurt other people? We either want people, maybe not necessarily, but we want people to be like us. If I'm miserable, you should be miserable too, right? If I'm sad, you should be sad too. It's hard for us to get out of that, our heads, when we're so heavy with the bags that we're carrying. Um, there's a, a scripture I want to turn to. I just had my place, sorry, I've got to... I took it out. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. It's kind of hard to do sometimes, you agree? Trust in him with your entire heart. And we talk about it, and we can quote scriptures, but then actually living that out, actually doing so, is a little bit harder. Because we have to trust him. We have to get outside of ourselves. We have to lay down some of our bags, or all of them, and we have to allow him to lead us. I have this deck of cards here. It's a little harder with my new microphone, but. Um, in our lives, we are all dealt cards. And we hold them up, and we look through them. Some of us daily look through what's been dealt to us in our lives. And you know, we only wanna show the pretty cards, right? Here's my church card. This is the one where I come, and I'm the youth pastor, and I worship with the kids, and I hang out with them, and we have so much fun, and we do activities. Here's my church card that I want you all to see. I'm going to put it up here where everyone can see it. And then I have my mom card. 
I like to do crafts with them. I like to go places with them, have little play dates, do little devotionals before we go to bed, all the sweet things that as moms we like to do, and everyone can see it. So I'm going to show you my mom card where I'm doing all these wonderful things with my kids. And then each of you have different cards, your shiny cards, all the ones that we put on to show that we're okay, that we're doing well, everything's great, my marriage, my children are behaving, my job's going great, I'm a Christian, and things are lovely. All the cards that we want you to see. But I have some other cards in my deck, cards that I don't want you to see, so I'm going to keep them back. I'm going to shuffle through them during the day, Man, I really hope you guys don't see this one today. This is the one where I'm tired, and my kids are crying, and I just want to rest. And then I have the cards where something's just not going right, but I always have to have my shiny cards on, so I don't want you to see them. I don't want you to see my, my sad cards. We don't want people to see the things that are, are carrying us, that are, are weighing us down, the things that are slowing us down. So we try to keep them hidden, and we try to, again, only show our nice cards. We all do it all the time because we don't want to appear to be weak. We don't want to appear to be unusable. But I'm holding them back, and I'm thinking, how can God use me with these cards that are in my deck? How can he use me with this one, which is my past? All the things that I've done that I carry along with me, and I keep them stuffed down, but this is my past, and how can he ever use me? How's he going to forgive me for this card? That stuff I did 10 years ago. How is he ever going to use my life when I've done something so awful that I can't even forgive myself? So I'm just going to tuck them away. I'm going to try to hide them between my good cards so that everyone only sees those positive things. But in the meantime, while I'm just showing my shiny, nice cards, those other cards are still there. And if I don't deal with them, they're eventually going to take over. They're eventually going to come out, and I'm going to have a massive freak out. Have you guys ever had a massive freak out? I kind of feel like I do it a lot sometimes. <laughs> it's because we're trying to put this face on because we feel like we have to be something for everybody else. I can't appear weak. I can't appear to be burdened because I've got other things to do. I've got to look good, and I don't want anyone to know about these things. Maybe I'm going to have that friend who I'm going to trust her with some of those cards, and then she tells other people, and now my cards are out. And then you have to go through some more baggage. You pick up more things. But I'm here to talk to you guys today about learning to drop those bags, learning to get rid of those cards. They're part of you, and you can't just keep stuffing them behind the nice, shiny cards. We can't keep putting that face on that says, hey, there's nothing wrong with me. I am perfect. I have great kids. My marriage is great. The people around me are great. I have the best friends ever. The things that we try to say when we're really hurting, we have to figure out how to come to Christ and say, hey, I need you to take these things. I need you to take these bags. And like she said, he will take it. But how often do we say, I need you to take these things, and then we keep holding on to them, or we pick them back up. And then we start to step back and say, hey, God's not going to be able to use me because I still have all this stuff. I'm not going to go and lead a small group because I really have too much stuff going on that who would want to listen to me? Who would want to hear what I have to share about Christ? Maybe my coworkers, hey, I'm not, I'm not worthy enough or I don't know enough scripture enough to share Christ with my, with my coworkers or the people around me, so I'm going to keep it back hidden because I've got all this stuff. And maybe they know it about you. Maybe your life, you show some of your other cards and you're saying, hey, they're going to judge me. Why would they listen to me, or why would they take me seriously? So today we're just talking about baggage and how God says in the Bible that he will take it and that he will use you no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what cards you have, whether you're showing them or not, you have them, and he will use them for his glory. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
And I'm here to tell you guys today that he wants to use you, and he will use you if you let him. Now, we're going to have a couple of youth kids come up, and they're going to share a couple of people in the Bible that we've picked out that have a lot of baggage. They have a lot of stuff going on, and God still used them. So the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Brianna Bosley. Isn't working. Okay. Okay, so most people have probably heard of David and how probably he was such an awesome follower of God and how he's said to um, have, he was a man after God's own heart, but a lot of people don't realize how much baggage he actually had and how he sinned just like we do and he made a lot of mistakes. And so he picked up a lot of baggage along the way and there were just three situations that I thought of when I had to think of the baggage. So the first was when he was just a little shepherd boy. And, okay, so it was time for Samuel to anoint somebody as king. And he had set apart Jesse and his eight sons to figure out who was going to be anointed as king. So Jesse had first his seven sons walk across Samuel, and Samuel knew that they weren't the chosen ones by God. And he was like, do you have any more sons? So Jesse sent for David, and David walked across, and... Samuel knew that he was chosen by God. So it said in 1 Samuel 16, 12, Then the Lord said, Get up and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel anointed David in front of all of his seven brothers. So you can imagine how much bitterness and jealousy that just accumulated from that. And that could have added a lot of baggage to David because he's like, My brothers are so jealous of me now because I get to be king and they just saw me. And they just got really jealous. So the next situation was when the Philistines gathered and they were going to fight the, the Israelites. So the Philistines had Goliath and he was over nine feet tall, so it's huge. And uh, Jesse told David, David was in, he was taking care of the sheep and his dad told him to bring supplies to the front lines and bring them to his brothers. So he did that. And when he got to the front lines, he went, or when he got to the, the battle, he went straight to the front lines and he started asking questions around him. And in 1 Samuel 17, 26 through 27, it says, David spoke to the men who were standing near him. He asked them, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Goliath is bringing shame on Israel. What will be done for the one who removes it? This Philistine isn't even circumcised. He dares the armies of the living God to fight him. Who does he think he is? The men told David what Israel's soldiers had been saying. The men told him what would be done for the man who killed Goliath. So he was just going around and he was asking questions just really innocently and he wasn't even speaking to his brother. But then when you go on to the next verse, it says, David's oldest brother Eliab heard him speaking with the men, so he burned with anger at him. He asked him, why have you come down here? Who did you leave those sheep with in the desert? I know how proud you are. I know how evil your heart is. The only reason you came down here was to watch the battle. What have I done now, said David, can't I even speak? Then he turned away to speak to some other men. He asked them the same question he'd asked before, and they gave him the same answer. So Eliab was burning with anger against David. And this just added another bag, because when your brother is burning with anger against you, you're going to feel it, and that's just going to add a lot more baggage. So the next situation was when you move forward some years to when David was king. So all the army went off to the battle, and usually David goes with them to battle, but he actually stayed back in Jerusalem. And he was in his room, and he saw Bathsheba. And he sent for her, and she came, and later he found out that she got pregnant that night. And Bathsheba had a husband named Uriah, and David knew it, so he had to do something about it. So in 2 Samuel 11, 6-9, it says, so David sent a message to Joab. It said, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent him to David. Uriah came to David. David asked him how Joab and the soldiers were doing. He also asked him how the war was going. David said to Uriah, go home and enjoy some time with your wife. So Uriah left the palace. Then the king sent him a gift. But Uriah didn't go home. Instead, he slept at the entrance to the palace. He stayed there with all of his master's servants. So David just tried to cover up a secret 
and he tried to fix it, but he just added more baggage by hiding it because nothing, nothing he tried worked. And so he finally just tried to end it, and he sent a message to the battle, and he had Uriah killed on the front lines. So David made many, many mistakes throughout, throughout his life, and he even did this when God showed favor to him. So in 1 Samuel 13, 14, it says, But now your kingdom won't last. The Lord has, the Lord has already looked for a man who is dear to his heart. He has appointed him leader of the people. That's because you haven't obeyed the Lord's command. This was talking about Saul, and it was saying that he's a man dear to his heart. And then also in Acts 13, 22, it says, God removed him and made David their king. Here's God's witness about him. David, son of Jesse, is a man dear to my heart, he said. He will do everything I want him to do. So David, even though he was considered a man after God's own heart, he still made a lot of mistakes, and he still had a lot of baggage just like we do. We just have to learn to let it go and give it to God. My name is Clayton Talbert. I'm in the eighth grade, and I go to this group. I was given Peter the Apostle to talk about his baggage. And Peter was actually the second disciple chosen by Jesus behind his brother Andrew. And Peter was a very strong leader among all of the disciples. Jesus even nicknamed him the Rock, which means that God's going to build his church on Peter. But even though Peter was a great man, he even had his own baggage. If you please turn to me with to John 13, 37 and 38. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. In those verses, Peter saying he would do anything, go anywhere, and die for Jesus. But the truth is, Jesus knew he would fail. Jesus even told him that he would deny him three times before the rooster crows. Peter thought he had it all together. But just a little while later, in John 18, 26 and 27, One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Again, Peter thought he had it all together, but when the rooster crowed, he realized he just denied his own God. Imagine being Peter at that point, thinking you just denied your own God. Peter felt awful and worthless to God, but like he couldn't be used by him again. That kind of baggage could have hindered Peter from following God's will for the rest of his life. Hello, I'm Tinashe. I'll be talking about Saul. Um, before, I mean, well, Paul, um, before people know Paul mostly as Paul, but um, his real name is Saul. Um, Saul had a lot of baggage, like take for instance, um, Acts 7. Stephen was being hit and pelted with, with a lot of rocks and Saul was just standing there holding people's jackets and approving and cheering for all, for pretty much all of it. And if that's not enough, like he continued to be more ruthless in Acts 8.3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and, and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And as time went on, Saul continued, like his hate for the Lord just continued, um, and he started breathing out threats and murder to the Lord's disciples. And he went to see the high priest, and he, um, he started, he asked the high priest to see if he could be able to 
bring men and women to trial. Um, and after some time, Saul went to Damascus and went, and right before entering Damascus, he saw Jesus and Jesus, um, he was having a conversation with Jesus. And during the conversation, Paul, Saul was instantly blinded and um, Jesus told Saul to go into Damascus to, and wait there for three days. Um, and you would think for three days being blind, he would have time to sit there and think of all the things that have happened, that he has done, and all the baggage that he is carrying, and it must feel like a bag of bricks just weighing him down. And I'm pretty sure even after he got saved and he was not blind anymore, and he was following Jesus, he must have felt that like, like he was being a hypocrite to those he was um, going back to those he, what he, he had imprisoned and those who were following him he must have felt like a hypocrite and I'm pretty sure that once Saul changed to Paul that none of that even mattered to him anymore. Hello. I gotta get this up here a little bit. <coughs> well, I hope you guys are enjoying the service so far. Um, I know these guys have gone through a lot of work and doing a lot of practice and trying to nail all these different things that they're doing. And then when you kind of get up on stage in front of the lights and all of your faces, it's, it's really hard to do. It's, it's pretty crazy. So I'm proud of all you guys for, for everything that you guys have done so far. Also, I just think it's kind of cool just, you know, uh, we all have different tastes of how we like our services to go, but just being in here together in one room as a family and as a community and just being able to worship God together, I am excited about it. I've been excited about this day for a long time, and I just think, I just think it's really cool. So um, we're talking about baggage, um, uh, obviously, and uh, I think it's for me, because I'm a youth pastor, my initial uh, reaction is to look at the angle from how that affects teenagers. That's kind of where I jumped immediately. Um, teenagers have to go through so much junk from middle school to high school with their friends and the relationships and these, these expectations of them and their stereotypes and all these labels that they can acquire um, at a very young age. They can really pick up a lot of baggage. Um, but I kind of changed directions a little bit and I wanted to talk about uh, how us as adults pick up baggage. I get, to, I get to yell at them every, every week, and they have to listen to me, but um, uh, as adults, uh, um, oh, I also, I turned 27 uh, on Friday, so I feel like I can say us as adults now. I didn't feel like I could say that before, um, <laughs> but we have a lot of baggage, too, as adults that sometimes I, I think we don't realize, you know, we can easily focus in on kids and teens and say, oh, yeah, you guys got all this baggage, but... Um, if we carry that baggage from, from our younger years, if that, if that follows us through our entire life into our adulthood, uh, the baggage that we carry kind of evolves and it changes and it grows and it expands and it, it overflows into all these other different areas in our life. And we do, we continue to carry it for our entire lives until we decide to get rid of it. Um, our baggage can be very heavy. It can weigh us down, and uh, much like a lot of the people that have come up and talked to you already, um, it can hinder us, and it can keep us from the calling that God has on our life. And it's at those times that I like to look at these great men of the Bible um, because they inspire me so much. Uh, you look at guys like Peter and Paul and David, and these guys just did such amazing things for God. They had this will and this determination um, to follow after Christ and this love for all of these people and the, all these lost people and hurting people around them, and it, it inspires me. And one story that I heard just a few weeks ago was of Paul, and I'd never heard this story before. And um, I guess Paul, you know, he was going around in all these different cities, and he was preaching to all these people. And uh, occasionally, more times than not, he would run into resistance. He would run into people that, that did not necessarily agree or like with uh, what he had to say. And so in this particular time, these group of guys, they come in, and they rile up the crowds, and they get everybody on their side, and they decide they're going to stone Paul in the city right there. And I don't know, I, I'm sure all of you know what it means to be stoned, but if you really sit down and think about it, there's a group of people that hate you with a ferocity, and they have baseball-sized rocks that they're going to chuck at you as hard as they can until you die. 
maybe one of the worst ways to die that I can think of, because what are you going to do when somebody starts throwing rocks at you? You're going to try and protect yourself. And I imagine you're going to have to take a lot of shots before you eventually pass out or, or maybe even die, which that's exactly what Paul did. He actually passes out, and the crowd thinks that he's dead. So they drag his body out of the city, and they leave him outside to die. And his friends pick him up, they find him, they realize, oh, he's not dead. And uh, they pick him up and they dust him off. Now, if I'm Paul in that moment, I just got hit with rocks. I've been working real hard for God for the whole day. You know, I'm doing what I can for the ministry. I feel like maybe my job for that day is complete. It's done. I could maybe go home, take a rest, maybe go to a different city. I'll hit that city again on the way back if I have to. But I'm done with that city for now. They don't like me. They don't agree with me. What's Paul do? He says he dusts himself off. I think it's Acts chapter 14. He dusts himself off, walks right back into the city. I'm not done with them. I had some more things to say. I'm going back in there for a minute. <laughs> And I just thought that was really cool because you can see just in that short little uh, section of verses that Paul knew exactly what God wanted from his life. He knew the plan and he had the will and the determination to follow it no matter what. Chuck rocks at him, try and kill him, didn't matter. He knew what he was supposed to do and he was going to go and do it. So that's what I see with with some of these great guys. But another thing that I see with these exact same men, which is what inspires me, is we see their baggage. We see their faults and we see their mistakes. Um, If you look with me and if you have your Bibles in John chapter 21, verse 15, um, this is kind of what Clayton was talking about a little bit. Uh, Just prior to this event, just prior to this event, Peter had denied Christ. And just like Clayton was saying, he had told Jesus, I would never do that. I'll follow you anywhere. I'll go anywhere with you. I will never deny you. I will even die for you. And then all of a sudden he denies Christ. We talked about this last week in youth group. Peter had a radical faith. He was willing to do whatever it took um, to follow Jesus, or at least he thought at the time. His faith was then called into question. His faith then required action. It required sacrifice. It required him to actually do something beyond just words. And that's when we see Peter fall and stumble. And the failure almost destroys him. He probably felt pretty defeated. I don't know if you can put yourself in his shoes, but um, not only did he deny Christ, he denied somebody that was considered his best friend, somebody that he'd been walking with and learning from and doing all these things with, and he denies him. He denies he even knows him. Oh, and one interesting fact, too, is that one of the people that he denies Christ to is a small child. A little girl runs up to him and says, hey, don't you know, aren't you with Jesus Christ? And he says, no. I don't know that guy. Never knew him. He had invested so much time and so much energy to this one point in his life where he was going to be tested, and he fell. And now the one guy that's been leading him, that's been, that he's been following, has been giving him all this guidance and all this direction throughout this, all this time, he's now gone. He's dead, and it's directly his fault. And so he probably feels very lost and alone. But Jesus wasn't done with Peter, so we're going to look here in John chapter 21, verse 15. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird and carry you where you do not wish. And this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So you see this epic failing of Peter, this horrific downfall that he thinks he's committed, that that he thinks has has essentially ended his usefulness in the ministry, Jesus says, no, I don't think so. I can still use you. I still want to use Peter. But um, Peter, at the time, God understood, wasn't in any condition to be used. And so we see right there in uh, chapter 21 that God has to restore Peter to make him useful for the ministry on the beach. So three times Peter denies Christ. Three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Peter says each time, yes, Lord, I love you. And um, 
three times after that, Jesus tells him to do one thing. He says, feed my sheep. You love me? Then feed my sheep. God knew Peter wasn't ready to fulfill the plan that God had for Peter's future, for his life. All of the things that he was going to have Peter do and use him for, he wasn't going to be able to complete those things in his current state. He was beaten down, and he felt defeated and alone. And God, that's why God, I think, appeared to Peter on the beach there and restored him. But here's the kicker. You ready? After God restores Peter, after God gets Peter to lay all his baggage on the ground and just drop it, uh, Jesus said one last thing to him. It's the end of verse 19. Um, He says what? He says, follow me. After we lay our baggage down, we still have to follow Christ. It's not enough just to put it down. We have to know the calling that we have, that God has for our life, and we have to be willing to follow it. But that's not always easy. It's really easy to pick baggage up. I think we would agree. We can pick it up in so many different areas of our life. And honestly, it's not even that hard putting our baggage down every once in a while. How many of us, at one time or another, we've been convicted with a sin, or we've been convicted with something that's holding us back or weighing us down, and we say, here, God, I'm going to give this bag to you because I feel convicted of it right now. And then we walk away. And then we get that feeling like, oh, actually, I think, I think I need to go back and take that back from you. I do it all the time. I do it with my finances. I do it with stuff where I say, hey, God, I'm going to trust this to you until maybe like a day, and then I start to feel uncomfortable about it, and then I'm going to take it back. That's the hard part. Actually leaving our bags down on the ground. Actually leaving them with God and not going back a few days later and getting them. It's a constant, everyday battle not a one-time decision. So the hard part is not letting that baggage get in the way, blind us, or weigh us down from the calling that God has in our life so that God can use us to do great things. After being restored on the beach, Peter goes on to preach at Pentecost, and the Bible says 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. Paul was restored on the road to Damascus when God blinded him. Paul goes on to be one of the greatest missionaries of all time and in his spare time has time to write like a third of the New Testament. These were great men of the Bible. Aside from Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the creator of the entire universe, except for him, the Bible doesn't talk about God using sinless, perfect people to do his work. God uses everyday, ordinary Joe Schmoes like you and me to do all of his bidding, to get glory and honor for him. But the question is, are we willing? Are we ready to be restored? Or are we still clinging to our package? Are we still trying desperately like David to fix and control things ourselves? If we're willing, my challenge for you today is to take everything that you have, every label, every mistake, every vice, every sin, anything that's holding you back from the will of God in your life and boldly go before the throne of God and just lay it at his feet. The Bible says God's able to carry it. He says that his burden is so much lighter and if we will trade that, if we will give him our burdens and take on his, then it's so much lighter. So if you decide to do that today, I want you to expect one thing. Expect God to do great and mighty things in your life. If you are able and you are willing to lay your baggage at his feet and leave it there, he's going to do great things through you. But he's going to do great things that are going to bring honor to him, not to you. That are going to do things for his glory and his praise. But first we have to be restored and we have to lay our bags down. Thank you.